The stock market is a confusing, hectic place where terms are thrown around like we were born with them. The fact is that we weren't, and it takes a while to learn where each of them are. So today I want to supercharge that process and let you join the ride from wherever you're already at. Today I want to start with a really big debate. What is the real difference between ETFs and managed funds? And what even are each of these specifically in the first place? So I want to take you on a ride, step by step, looking at what each of these overall are, and then each specifically, and then I'll also look at the fees and how they differ between them. Well, the main idea of both of these is that you're putting your money in once, and then it's split up between many different investments. So on one hand, we have ETFs, which are just stocks. Like you can have different types of stocks, but they're just still all stocks. And then on the other hand, we have managed funds. And you can still have stocks, but you can also have bonds, currencies, and even a property. So the overall idea is this instant diversification. How you're putting your money in once, and then it's instantly split up between lots of different places without you having to do anything. Okay, so starting with ETFs, or exchange traded funds, they are a collection of stocks that a company such as Vanguard would put together into their own unique collection. And this would make up the holdings of their fund. And any normal investor can buy just a piece out of that pie. But what happens is that you're still getting a small chunk of everything that's hidden behind. To know how much of each individual stock you're getting, you would then have to look at the overall percentage that that um, stock holds within the holdings of the fund. Managed funds, as explained earlier, can be a lot more diversified than just investing into the stock market. But that isn't their only difference. They can also be a lot more specific and personalised than ETFs can. What you'll find with managed funds is that they require multiple investors to invest the money into one pool, no matter how big their investment is. An investment firm would then collate all this money and then make individual trades based on what these different investors might believe in. And you can pass up on these individual trading fees and just have to worry about what comes out the other end and into your pocket. Now, you'd have to be a pretty rich person to be able to get a managed fund for yourself. Oh wait, wouldn't that just be investing on your own, or maybe with a bit of help from an investment advisor? Now, the fees are also going to differ between these two options, which can be a little bit intuitive if you think about what each of these does, how ETFs will hardly change their holdings, and managed funds might do it on a daily basis. So ETFs will have usually not as high fees, but you also won't see them that often, how they're usually hidden behind the scenes of a stock that appears normal on the stock market. And then they take this fee as a cut of the dividends calculated as an annual percentage. So that way you pretty much just won't even see the money that they take in the first place because you'll just get paid dividends as usual. And the other fee that you might encounter would be the normal trading fee because you are still technically buying a stock on the stock market. Investing into managed funds will usually see these fees being turned into a higher rate. And this is just because managed funds are a lot more hands-on. But these fees are also taken in a different way. Because you're just creating a pool of money for an investment firm to use, they can only really take your money out as if they're taking a top percentage of the money that you have and then writing it as if it's their own. So this would mean that you would basically hope that they make you money because then that percentage that they have to take off the top would be less than what you've earned in that year. There are two basic classifications of a stock that are independent of all of its other names and factors. These are common and preferred, and your common stock would be the more typical sense of part ownership in a company. You would get certain voting rights to different company policies or expansion ideas, but you also don't get priority over things like dividends. So these preferred stocks are willing to give up their right to the voting. However, they do get priority in terms of dividends, or if the company liquidates, they will get paid first, before all the other fees are paid. And what can happen is that these common stocks are usually held by the founder or employees of the company, because they're the people who really need the voting rights, because they're the people living out that company. However, your common investor might go for preferred stocks, because they don't have to stay up to date with all the day-to-day -day happenings of the company, they can just reap the rewards of all the different dividends. An IPO is a company's initial public offering, the last step between them and being a listed company on the stock exchange. It's also the first real chance that the public gets an opportunity to buy into that company and start reaping the rewards of what that company decides to do. A company would do this in order to try and raise capital and grow faster. 
However, they are at risk of some scrutiny because they're put under the spotlight from the general public because once they become a company on the listed market, they then have to release all their revenue reports, etc. You can still invest into a company before this in a few different ways. The first is through crowdfunding, where a company might need some more money to help fund its endeavors. And it will put out a limited time offer for you to donate some money. During this crowdfunding, the company will usually state what the share value is. So if you donated $10,000 into two different companies, you can end up with drastically different share counts. You'll usually get a revaluation if a company decides to crowdfund again because they want to be able to tell their existing donors what their share value is so that you can get a real gauge of how your belief in the company has affected you. The second way that you could end up having part ownership in one of these private companies is through working for that private company because they may have internal options or benefits to be able to buy into them. So instead of maybe your cash bonus or as a long-term employment benefit, you might be able to buy into the company. And this provides a real incentive to do hard work because your work directly affects the company's value and therefore your own share value. Stocks change value all the time based on the current trends and trades happening within the market. However, some stocks can be described as cyclical or just non-cyclical. The cyclical stocks will usually be more prone to being versatile and following the market when things such as recessions or expansion happen. But non-cyclical stocks will be more prone to these things and will stay straighter over time. However, you will still get the small bumps over the year. Examples of these cyclical companies include technology staples such as Apple or Samsung. Because they release their products at specific times throughout the year, their own sales numbers even follow this cyclical pattern. But the more core, stable companies within industries such as food and beverages, agriculture and utilities will all be a lot less cyclical because they're needed no matter what else happens. Okay, so here's a big one that you've probably heard the name of, penny stocks. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that that's probably talking about companies with a share value that's pretty low but it isn't always fully understood because you might not know what exactly that value is talking about. So the current um, description is that a penny stock is a company with a share value under $5. However, it used to be $1, which is what makes it confusing because it's also called a penny stock. But you can also probably figure out that at this low share value, it's also a very volatile stock because any small change in this dollar value means a pretty large overall percentage change. This speculative and volatile nature is what attracts certain investors who like to take bets or try and outplay the market. However, it can lose the investor a lot of money in a very short period of time. Getting into one of the more common types of stocks, we have growth stocks, which you can probably guess are all about growing faster than the other companies. This might be because they're newer or younger or because they're undertaking plans of expansion, merging or acquisition of other companies. This will lead to strides of positive media attention, which will attract new investors. This explosive growth can also lead to overall volatility, meaning that in a dip in the market, they may see above the average losses because they're just not as established and trusted by investors to be able to last through that dip in the market. This aspect of growing quickly can be enticing to investors. However, if you're an investor looking for passive income, this isn't always the share to go for because these younger companies or companies that want to currently grow aren't going to go and give out their money to investors because then they won't be able to actually do that growing. Similar to growth stocks, we have value stocks, which are seen to maybe be undervalued compared to other companies in the market that have similar fundamentals. And these fundamentals can include dividends, earnings, and sales. And what makes them different is that they're in industries which are generally... <laughs> well... What I was trying to say is that these industries will usually be ones that we heavily rely on, no matter what's happening with economic changes. So these could be finance, healthcare, or utilities. So by trading at a lower value than the performance would usually indicate, you could take advantage of these higher dividend yields or other factors such as being able to recover quickly and maybe hit that point where they come back up to industry standards. So let's say during a recovery time after a recession, your company could then skyrocket higher up because they have more reliable income streams and by the end of everything, they'll be back up to where they should have been in the first place. Now, while we're talking about high dividend yield, we have to talk about income stocks. 
So, as what says in their name and their purpose, they will usually be less volatile than the overall market, and they're really the opposite of growth stocks because instead of growing quickly, they're providing you with a passive income. Similar to your income stocks, we've got your blue chip stocks. Now, these terms can be used interchangeably, and they usually will be. But blue chip stocks are usually your industry staples. The companies have been around for such a long time that they've got finalized products compared to that original IPO stage. And they'll be past their explosive growth stage and onto the time where they can provide steady income and not have too much volatility in their stock value. The way that you'll be able to tell what a blue chip stock is, is by looking at their market capitalization and their beta value. Now this market capitalization should be in the billions, and the beta should be under 1, because a beta value of 1 would mean that the stock is as volatile as the overall market. So being under it means that they're a lot more stable. Blue chip stocks are usually for those older investors, or maybe safer investors, who are looking for a place where their money won't change value too much, but they'll receive some passive income at the same time, through either stable or growing dividends. Defensive stocks are like the grandchildren of value, income, and blue chip stocks, because they're non-cyclical in nature, and therefore they'll be pretty stable and be able to maybe stay high during the downturn of a market, but they might also be able to make up for underrepresented wealth. These companies would be more likely to sell essential products and services such as healthcare, telecommunications, and utilities. And they're more enticing for the investors who might not know much about the stock market or the specific industry because of their ability to stay stable as well as producing high income. That's all for me to say. I've been Tom, and this has been Tom's Money Magic. See ya!